then management buyout, private equity, investment into Team 17. And 18 months ago, I floated Team 17 on the London Stock Exchange. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, tremendous growth over the last, gosh, two, three years. And uh, now, I guess with a market cap of almost 800 million, which is no incredible. No pressure, right? <laughs> um, but, you, you know, you had a, a great initial start with Worms, but that also caused some challenges. Kind of, what were some of the difficult moments over the years and how did you overcome them? I guess, um, I mean, I said I started when I was 16. Um, we found a team 17, I was 20. Uh, I'd say incredible highs. I think the first three years, 1990 to 1993, we had something like 35 games launched. None of them were called Worms. Um, we represented amazing talent around the world. People like Epic, we published their games over here in Europe. How Smart, we did their games. So we had a great start in life. I think at one point we had 52% market share, um, which is a frightening stat. The reality is we were a bunch of kids. Um, Worms landed in 1995. I think today it sold about 75 million units. What I would say one of the biggest learnings was we absolutely had no idea how to handle success. And that's what was probably the biggest learning factor for us. Um, everybody from the outside looking in at us would have gone Worms, huge, massive success. Those guys are flying. Um, I think I must have been about 23, 24. The lead programmer, Carl, I always remember Carl, um, going into work on a Monday morning. Um, we had the most expensive car park in West Yorkshire. You might not think there's a lot of money in West Yorkshire, but trust me, there's some. Um, and he'd been out at the weekend and bought a purple Lamborghini. And I was like, wow, and he's like 21 year old. We had no <laughs> idea how to manage success. And I'd say, you know, one of the biggest learnings is success can kill companies, you know, and you really need to remember this. It's how you manage success and keeping that side. So that hurt us quite hard. Um, ten games went into development. I don't think any of those games actually launched. And we then went on to spend the next decade and a half as a developer. To give you an idea, we had ten different publishers over 12 years, no consistency, and it was pretty painful. And so I'd say... Even when people look at us today and see what's happening, um, my senior management team, you know, there's a couple of guys here, um, of the 10 people that I look at across the top of Team 17, across the development side and the publishing team, there's 250 years of video games experience. All of us wear scars. We all know how, to, how you get this wrong. Um, and I think that's what drives a lot of us now. It's the hunger for success, but equally managing success and knowing how to do that properly. So, so for any of the independent game developers, what would you advise them how to build kind of a sustainable gaming business? Uh, whatever anybody tells you, seriously, it's hard work. Luck, <laughs> yeah, everybody talks about you need a bit of luck. Of course you do, you know, and uh, I like to think I'm a bit of a lucky person. I have a lucky number, I have lucky colors, you know, it's purple. Troy sent me a picture earlier. He was here way before I arrived, sent me a picture of the room and I went, wow, they've even got my color, you know. Um, silly little things, you know, um, <clears throat> but the reality is this is hard work. Uh, how many of you are actually founders of your own companies? Okay, quite a lot of you, right? So, you know, this is seven days a week. It's 24-7. You feel ill, it doesn't matter. You've got to get up. You've got to get on with it, you know. Um, it's hard, hard, hard work. And sustainability comes from many different ways. Um, I always say prior to doing our management buyout in 2011, Team 17 was a typical yo-yo developer. And that will resonate with a lot of people who work in A or AAA, where you've got milestones that lead up to the launch of a product. Um, and then when that game launches, all of that revenue is being recouped back from your publishers. So the following year, unless it's like out of the door, it's a hit immediately. And not that many do that. Um, you become a yo-yo developer. And that's where we sat for an awful long time. One of the key things for Team 17 um, today is our portfolio. We have a portfolio of over 100 games, you know, um, that do risks our business completely. We're, there's no one title dependencies, there's no platform dependencies. 
That's what makes sustainability. Back-to-back -back revenue growth, back-to-back -back profitability, and keeping a focus on that as well. Great. So you raised a lot of money over the years, both private and public. You did the management buyout. What would you advise any of the independent game developers here that are raising money and or also looking for like a publisher? Okay, quick one. How many people are looking to raise money? Okay. Right at the back, you should sit down near the front. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I always say about money, there's, right, first of all, let's just talk about money for a split second. Um, there's no such thing as free money, no matter what anybody tells you. There is no such thing as free money. Um, it doesn't matter whether that's um, family and friends investing, you know. One, they're looking for a return back from you, never mind the emotional baggage that brings as well, and I'm not a strong advocate of ever borrowing off family and friends. Um, private equity, venture capitalists, you know, Michael's better on some of this than what I am, but my limited understanding is very simple. They're looking for a return back on investment. Um, <laughs> All of them are looking at it, and they're not looking for a one times multiple return either. They're looking for a much higher return. Be realistic about this. Um, what I will say about investors, choose wisely. Choose wisely. Um, it's really hard. A lot of people will say there's lots of investment. There's never been as much money, I don't think, around the games industry as what there is right now. There's plenty of it around. Um, <clears throat> You know, it's a bit like a marriage. I know that sounds crazy, right? Because, you know, view investors a little bit like dating, right? Um, you never really know them until you've got married. But, you know, when it goes wrong, it's just like getting a divorce. So just bear that in mind. Um, you will probably meet them anywhere from... It depends on the kind of investors that you're looking for and what kind of business you've got. You might only meet these people four or five times, you know, and you've got to decide whether these are the people that you're taking your business into and your family as well because people working alongside you it's a big part for those two um private equity um i think when we did our management buyout i did that privately so that wasn't involving any third party finance coming into the business um i brought ldc private equity in and that was in 2016 uh same as when we did our IPO. When we brought private equity in and when we did our IPO, we actually didn't need any money. And Michael will tell you, um, there's no better time to go looking for money when you don't need it. Trust me. Um, it gives you an immense amount of control and an immense amount of decision making that you can put the right process in place for the people and for the business. Um, we spoke to a handful of private equity companies and all of them tabled an offer, but we had a very solid business. It had had, I mean, since we did um, our management buyout, I think we're in year eight or nine right now. So that's nine years of back-to-back -back revenue growth and profit growth. We've never gone backwards. That's really important. So you're showing the right signals of where your company's going. Um, so we didn't have a shortage of investors, but we had to find the right ones. Um, we like to do things a little bit different at Team 17. We chose a private equity company that had never invested in video games um, because they'd given us, they'd shown to us a different side of private equity. They were going to listen more. They were a minority shareholder anyway, but they were more approachable. They were more understanding. And I'd always had the vision of taking us to an IPO. I first looked at it in 2014. We weren't ready. We were a long way ready from doing it at that point. Um, and so bringing private equity in actually was a test for us as individuals. You know, um, how would we cope in board meetings? To some of you, you probably go, what's the big deal? Actually, it's really important as a creative industry and a creative business. We want to make the right kind of games. You know, the games that not only we want to make, but what our partners want to make. We don't really want somebody interfering in that side of it. We need to ensure that they're going to trust us. How would we cope? sharing management accounts with them every month, answering their questions, you know. Um, and so we did that. We put ourselves through the test. The good news was it went really great. We did 118% back-to-back growth that year. And <clears throat> when it came to the IPO, um, really simple. A lot of people have reached out to us. We've had trade inquiries for a long time around Team 17. Um, but it wasn't something that really appealed to us at that time. And I spoke to LDC and said, look, I'm not really that interested in doing a trade sell. 
Um, I'm not really that bothered about doing another private equity investment into the business because even though it would be a larger private equity, very silly, I didn't really connect the fact that when you take money from private equity, you have to give back. Um, and so I didn't want to have to do it all over again further down the line. So, we, you know, that didn't appeal. So for any of the studios out there that are considering going public, what would you advise them and, and what's the right stock exchange to pick or what are, what are the best options? Wow, okay, we're on the London Stock Exchange. I don't know enough about the rest of the world one, so I'm not going to comment about which country is the right one or the wrong one. Um, we chose um, AIM, which is a small cap market in the UK. It's our home. It's where Team 17 is based. Um, so I'd say look at the markets where you are, because being close, I know it sounds crazy, but we're about convenience too. You do have roadshows to do. You do have investors to go and visit. Having them in the UK made life easier for us, so that was important. Um, Make sure that you've got a really solid business if you're looking to flow. One thing I will say is look at visibility going forward constantly. You know, one thing that's not really that well known from Team 17 is over 70% of our, back, our revenue comes from our back catalogue. Right, that gives us great visibility on future years' revenue. I moan that it all goes to zero on January 1st because that's when our trading year starts, but 70% of our revenue comes from our back catalogue. You know, so that gives you great insight. So really having strong visibility. Team, you need a good team around you. It's expensive. Raising money is always expensive. I don't think as an industry we talk enough about the cost of raising money. You know, to float a business, you're talking a few million pounds to get a business away. Um, the ongoing costs, on, even on something like AIM, are around half a million to three quarters of a million pound a year. You know, so don't underestimate that side of it as well and the resources needed, manpower. You can't get away with a normal CFO, for instance. The market's like a public CFO. So, so some of, you, you mentioned that you have a really strong back catalogue. That's mm -hmm. great. Uh, for any kind of new games, I think you, besides publishing, you also co-develop yeah. them with the studios. What are kind of the ideal candidates for additional potential studios to partner up with? Oh, this is really easy, right? Um, <clears throat> we're incredibly passionate about making video games. We genuinely just want to work on great games with great people. We are genre agnostic. There's no one genre that we don't look at. We look at all genres. Um, the only space we've not really gone into yet is free to play, and that's because we're not experts in that area. And, you know, I know that'll lead nicely onto Michael's M&A question. Um, we, we, if we're not specialists, we will either acquire in that space or we will bring in the resources to make us experts in that space. One thing we know, we know what we're good at and we know what we're not good at. And that's another piece of good advice. Know what your strengths are and know what your weaknesses are. And for God's sake, hire your weaknesses. Great. Talking about M&A, you just acquired, I think, Yippie Entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, are we going to see more M&A deals this year? I can't answer this year because I get in trouble for that. Now, it's one thing about PLC world. You go to jail if you say things and they don't happen anymore. So I don't want to go to jail. M&A, um, yeah, definitely. We're looking at M&A. Um, we're looking at lo lots of different types. We're, you know, more than open about this. Great companies, great people, great IP. Um, we've acquired GP for a good reason. We need more development resources. Um, so we've set up Manchester as a second studio location, but we're equally looking for IP, we're looking for businesses that align with our strategy or actually take us into a space where we're not currently looking. Um, and so, yes, I'm very actively looking. So you're also looking free to play and potentially mobile? We're looking at a lot, yeah. Great. Um, you mentioned... Um, um, Kind of talking about the, the, the game developers potentially to partner with. Um, so what's the what's relationship and how much time do you spend with them on the development side versus on the publishing? And how, for people who don't work with you, how, maybe explain that a little bit more. Sure. Um, those who know me know I don't like the word publishing. I had many missed milestones in my developer days and it kind of still sends shivers down my spine a little bit. Um, we call ourselves a games label. It's inspired by the music industry, and a part of our business is very much inspired by the film industry, which is where we co-develop and apply additional freelance resources onto projects. The way that we view every relationship that we go into, we share the good days and we share the bad days together. It's a true partnership in every sense of the way. Um, we're their friends. 
we're part of their family and like I say we share all sides what's really important and it's part that we don't really talk about too much um, is our co-development side co-development is where we open up all of our internal development resources from day one so if you bring a game to us and you are at concept stage we'll work with you right from concept stage all the way through publishing Max is here, who's our head of publishing. Um, publishing comes on board anywhere from 12 months inwards towards the end, but the key part is we're working with you from day one. And it's all about ensuring that we can help you make the best game possible. So we give additional programmers, designers, artists. Our usability is one of the only ones in the UK. We have access to over 2,000 people that work alongside every game that we have all the way through development. Um, and that's to ensure that nothing's more important than the quality of the game. It doesn't matter what anybody says to you, it's all about making the best game possible. Great, thank you, Debbie, for providing insights, and please uh, give her a hand. Thank you. We do have time for perhaps one or two questions from the audience. Anyone would like to ask anything of Debbie? Oh, okay, sorry. Yes, sorry. Um, yeah, I was just wondering what it was that uh, that drove you or drives you to go to really what sounds like an awful lot of trouble to become a PLC if, if it's a successful you know, company already. Uh, at what point do you go, okay, I'll just relax? I think part of it's personal ambition, but two is actually being a role model. Um, I think the UK in particular, we're very good at selling our companies. and We're not so great at keeping old of IP and nurturing and growing businesses, certainly not in the gaming space. I think if you look at the gaming industry, historically, most of our great studios have been sold overseas. Um, so personal ambition is... I'm born in this country, I care about my country, so I want to float on the stock market, I want to challenge myself. The business side of it is, I think, we have to lead by example. Um, we have to lead for the next generation coming through to show that you can do this, that it can be done, um, and it can be done with a smile on your face. You know, that city world is crazy, don't get me wrong, it is crazy, I have a lot of fun with them. Um, and you're only as good as your numbers. I've realized that too. Um, they've told me they have dungeons if you get bad numbers, so I don't want to go in the dungeon. Um, but really, I think we, need, we, as a games industry, we actually need strong role models that are there as good examples for the future generation of companies. It'd be great if in you know, 10, 15 years' time we're looking at the, not just the UK markets, but other markets, and you're seeing, you know, whether it's Sweden, where you've got Paradox, THQ Nordic, you've got a handful of other studios, and similar in the UK, instead of selling those businesses, it'd be great to see that. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you guys were a limited company before. Uh, why is it important to go pub public for you? Why was it important to go public? I think going public allowed me to give the company to everybody in the business. Every single person who works at Team 17 is a shareholder. Um, that was really important. We have probably one of the most generous EBT schemes. Um, we care about our people and we're, believe it or not, every one of us um, in Team 17 at that top level is doing this at the highest level that we've ever done in our lives. So we're learning, but... I can't even explain to you what the feeling is like when you are part of a team that are building something quite special together, you know. Um, and I think that's so powerful in itself. Um, so I think the main reason was for our people, it's tradable, but equally I protected the business by doing this too, you know. Um, trade, sure, people can buy us, but they're gonna have to buy it in a very open way and it's gonna be very expensive, right? So it gives protection to the company and for our people. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, guys. That was great.